Thank you, Gavin, and thank you, Malaprops. It's, uh, and thank you, everybody who's come to hear us in conversation. I think I should call this conversation Barbara and Gavin part two, because we had another such conversation that was so wonderful and so exciting. And we're just going to go even deeper today. So thanks for being here and listening in. Yes, thanks, Patricia, very much for that beautiful introduction and that warm welcome. And Barbara, hi, it's great to see you again. Hi, again. And um, I want to tell our listener audience that you and I met about a year ago virtually. We've been never actually met in person, but I feel like we're long, long, dear, close friends anyway, because we've connected through our writing and our books. And we have a similar sensibilities Um you know, we were joking that we're, we should call ourselves writer who's, writers who dance and dancers who write. But I really do think that, you know, you're just as much of a dancer as, as I am or was in spirit and in, and in sensibility and definitely in the way that you write. And so I'm very excited to tell our audience more about the beauty of your book and um, so many of the thoughts that I have about it that I want everyone to, to know about. Um, so I'm going to start by asking you to tell us about the genesis of what disappears, because I know you've told me that it was a very long research process and you, you know, with your previous historical fiction, you've also dive, div, dove, divin, <laughs> dive very deeply into the research process and invested a lot of yourself in the writing. And I know what disappears was many years in the making. And the origin story of it is almost as fascinating as the story in the book itself. So please tell us how it came to be. I'd be glad to, Gavin. Thank you so much. Yeah, I don't even call it a research process. This was like a pregnancy. And it started so many decades ago. It's unbelievable. Um, it started when I left college a few months early and uh, went off cross country, hoping to get to the British Isles, met somebody in New Mexico who said she had a, a tower cottage that I could use um, to, to work and write. And I went there and I was there through a long winter and I wrote with my fingernails turning blue because it was not a winterized cottage. And I wrote some of the stories that my grandmother told me, my Nana, um, about her childhood growing up in Kishinev in the Pale of Settlement in Tsarist Russia, which um, it was very colorf colorful. She was, didn't, my Nana didn't use a lot of words. She was rather taciturn and she sounded like she had just gotten off the boat from Russia, even though she had spent most of her adult life in the United States. And her, her first, quest, her first uh, comment whenever I asked her one of my questions was, who remembers? But then, then little by little, I could get her to give me little, little details about her life there. Her, her family, my family, was um, they were tailors, they were Jewish. They lived in this town, which was sort of peaceful for a long time. The Jews getting along with the Christians, everybody got along. They uh, made the hats and coats for the local parochial school, which gave my family a special connection to the priest. And my grandmother told me that when there was to be a pogrom, an action you know, directed by the czar against the Jews, the priest would warn them and allow them to shelter in the attic of the church. This was so fascinating to me. Um, she also told me that twice a year, her mother would take the train to Paris to see the fashions. This made absolutely no sense to me. She was a modest woman. She certainly didn't speak French. Um, they didn't have a lot of money. And it would have been really odd for a woman like that to travel alone such a long distance. And after I wrote these, this little collection of stories that I called The Russian Winter, I cogitated about this through the writing of three other novels um, that were published over the years. And then somebody showed me an archive of first edition books about Sergei Diaghilev's Ballet Russe in Paris. I was so fascinated by the, the artwork, by the cultural history, and I started doing book research on that. And suddenly in my research, I found a reason, an emotional reason 
why someone like my great grandmother would have taken the risk and the expense to travel to Paris alone. And the reason I thought of that came to me was that she was looking for her twin, someone who'd been separated from her. And so that's how the next iteration of the story, the final iteration came to be, but it took 40 years of cogitating about this to make it make emotional sense. And it also took my own sister, my only sister, deciding she wanted nothing to do with me anymore, which made me understand the emotions that would be involved, the longing, the yearning, as the Brazilians say, saudade, that would propel this book. Mm. So it came together with research and with my own personal story as well. How much research did you have to do on just the strictly historical timeline of, of things in that era? Because what disappears includes so many details about you know, the war and the uprising and then the social change in both in Paris and in France and I mean, and in Russia. Um, how much of that did you know already? And did you, you know, have to really go back and make sure you had all your history facts right? Well, I, I knew almost nothing. You know, when I started out, I had to go to history books, to memoirs that were contemporaneous in those times. Uh, to autobiographies of people in those times, to photo collections, photo archives, film archives, anything I could find anywhere. So I, um, I made a timeline for my characters and then I superimposed over that a timeline of those times. The book covers a long period of history. It's multi-generational. Right. So it starts out in the 1880s and it goes it actually goes a little further than the start of World War I because there's a sort of afterward section that takes place in um, 1929. So it's, it's a long span and I had to do a tremendous amount of research, but I loved it. I never liked history as a subject in school. I liked art history, I liked literary history, but when history is connected to people I'm researching or imagining, recreating, then history has a huge fascination for me. That's so interesting because that's something you and I have talked about a little bit before. Um, there was this quote, there was a New Yorker article recently that we both read and uh, one line from it just hit me very strong. Um, I'm not going to quote it verbatim, but it's something along the lines of historians tell us what happened or tell us the events and uh, novelists tell us how it felt yes. and then historical novelists do both. Yes. And that's exactly why historical fiction is so gripping, I think, and why it just has such a powerful emotional impact for readers. It's so real and yet it has that uh, fictional element that makes it easy for the reader to imagine themselves in that place you know, because it's not just strict facts. You know, you're able to actually imagine yourself being part of that story. And yeah. Well, that's the hope. And I think that I think that historical fiction has really changed. You know, it's um, it's not genre uh, fiction anymore. You know, the, the really great historical fiction has fully realized characters, fully believable emotions and relationships, very nuanced. So I don't even like to consider it a um, a genre. I mean, I, it's a branch of literary fiction that happens to take place at, at a, a historical time. Yeah, I, I agree completely. It's um, I, I wasn't reading what disappears, you know, thinking of it in that specific, you know, niche at all. Um, it was just a, a beautiful story and made all the more um, impactful because I had those landmarks, the historical landmarks to relate to. But what you do so brilliantly in what disappears is bring those characters to life and for me particularly having been a ballet dancer myself and written about it um, the way that you bring the Jeanette character who is one of the twins I'll not give away the whole story for people who are watching who haven't read it but uh, the twins that are separated and one of them does become a ballet dancer and your descriptions of her um, 
her emotional sensibility and her thoughts and her physicality and her being are so poignant and so accurate. Um, you know, I'm a nonfiction writer. I wrote my memoir as a way to tell the world what it was like to be a ballet dancer because I have not read any ballet fiction that was accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it has been, remains so frustrating to me that, you know, novelists have been unable or maybe unwilling to truly portray the sensibility of a ballet dancer or the ballet world. And then reading your depiction of it was so startling to me because, you know, you weren't even a, I mean, you, I know you train very seriously in ballet, but you didn't make it your life and, or your profession, yet you really got into the head of this one character. And, um, it just, it spoke to me about the timelessness of the human experience. And I think that's another reason why a historical fiction is so relatable to readers, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on getting inside the head of your character. Well, I, you know, for this reason, it, it was so important to me. Uh, it was so validating to me to uh, get your um, wonderful jacket quote, which is how we first met and um, to realize that the book spoke accurately to you. And I, it amazes me still. Um, I think it's some sort of mystical process that happens when fiction is being written because I really never did train as a ballet dancer. I mean, I have to be honest and all my teachers will be able to <laughs> attest to this. I mean, I've taken every kind of dance class, including some ballet, but in terms of um, training, I, I don't, I don't even compare, but I think that I have a sort of um, malleable memory, which is able to receive um, impressions very vividly from other, well, I'll almost say other lives or other ways of life and even other times. So that's what happened very much with these characters. And, and it happened before with my novel, Vivaldi's Virgins and my other novel from the 14th century, A Golden Web. It just, I don't know, it's a mystical process of the writer opening herself up and receiving, being a kind of antenna. But you did this, it was sort of the reverse process in what you did in your memoir, which made it so, so vivid. And you let the reader in so that the reader really experiences being a ballerina from the inside. It was, it was an extraordinary thing to read and, and validating for me too, because it really resonated not only with my experience, but, but with the experiences of my fictional characters and my historical characters. I was so pleased. Oh, well, thanks. Thank you very much, Barbara. That means a lot. Um, it, you know, because I, think of myself as a sort of a fraud writer. I'm just a ballet dancer who started to write and then suddenly I had a book. So to be validated by someone who's a real writer is really quite something. But I mean, another thing that we've connected about and talked about is the blurred lines between memoir and fiction. Yes. And yeah. I, you know, I wrote my memoir. A lot of it is not in my voice and not, it's not fiction. It's all extremely real, <laughs> but I use other people's other voices and other perspectives as a way to kind of enable myself to fully tell my story. And I think now talk about reverse processes. I wonder if you as a novelist have done that with your characters. Do you use your characters' voices to kind of tell your own story? Well, not really. My, my own story, when it comes into a novel, sneaks in. And often I don't even notice it um, until the book is published and somebody else tells me, oh, wow, the orphan scenario, that's very powerful for you, Barbara Quick. And, you know, I didn't set out to write that at all. I'm not an orphan, but evidently, emotionally, I grew up feeling like an orphan and still do. Um, and in, in terms of feeling like a, a fraud, you know, it sounds like we both feel like frauds. I mean, I feel like a, a fraudulent ballet dancer. You feel like a fraudulent writer, but you have, you know, you're a great writer, Gavin. So there's nothing fraudulent about it at all. Um, receiving the voices, uh, I feel like I have to actually get out of the way so that the I can hear the voices. And when things are going really well, writing fiction, and I always write by hand, in a notebook, right alongside with everything else, my poetry, my journal, and the fiction goes in there in its first draft with a fountain pen 
Oh I am listening and often I wake up in the morning. That's such a, I think poets especially are sort of wired weirdly. We're sort of freaks of nature and that we have a lot of um, voices going on in our heads. And my character's voices just, I hear them. And often first thing in the morning is when I hear them. And it's like, you know, getting my little butterfly net and, you know, grabbing one of those uh, sentences out of the ether and wow. say, oh, yes, I've captured it and putting it down on the page. And that's a starting point. Yeah. And then I can run with that. Would you read a passage? I think this would be a great time to hear, hear one of those voices. I would love to. Thank you. Um, this is a scene towards the beginning of the book that takes place in the Jewish orphanage of Kishinev, where um, a childless and prosperous French couple has shown up because the, uh, the wife had a distant relative who was Jewish and they, they hid this fact from their bourgeois families. And um, she has had one miscarriage after another and she feels that perhaps there's a baby waiting for her in the town where her grandmother, her Jewish grandmother came from. So here they are inside the orphanage. A cascade of silvery, distinctly babyish laughter reached their ears from the floor above them. Madame Dupre reacted to the sound like a hunting dog that scents its prey. Following her gaze, Golda, the matron's assistant, said, oh, that is just Sonia and Zanetta, always making jokes together. Special case. I can show you youngest orphans in day room now. Very nice girls. I cannot authorize, but you can look. This way, please. But before she could stop them, Madame Dupre, surprisingly fleet in her high heels, had launched herself upstairs. Her husband had to take the stairs two at a time to keep up with her. Golda scurried after them, calling out, Madame, Monsieur, not that way, please. Passing two empty dormitories on the hallway, they entered a third, smaller room where all the bassinets were empty, save one. Madame took her husband's hand, leading him straight to the bassinet that held Sonia and Zanetta. Entranced, Madame looked down at the babies, perfect baby girls, perhaps nine months old. One slept or pretended to sleep while the other looked up with large blue eyes at the two strange faces hovering above her. Her delicate brows knitted and her tiny chin began to quiver. But then her gaze lit on the brooch Madame Dupre wore on her lapel. It shimmered with a setting of dark pink rubies and very small diamonds, very small, very shiny in the slanting light that came in through the window. The baby's face broke into a smile as she reached out with one dimpled hand towards the magenta tinged sparkles of color and light. Madame Dupre's eyes filled with tears. She reached down and gathered the baby into her arms, embracing her with all the unused genius of her frustrated maternity. Oh, you sweet little darling, I knew I would find you here. Neither Madame nor Monsieur Dupre paid any attention to Golda's objections, which segued from French to Russian as her voice became more and more agitated. I will lose my position, you ridiculous people, she shouted at them in Russian. Do you not have a heart in your body? Have I not used the correct word for twins? Jumelle, she shouted in French. Les jumelles, Zanetta is one of two. They must not be separated. But they were. Not to break it to the people who haven't read but <laughs> they were and then the story unfolds further and further and deeper and deeper from there and oh goes oh, the twins have each 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 sister has quite different paths and journeys and they they do meet again in the most unlikely way um i you know when i was reading the book i didn't think about the title very much until i got really close to the end 
And then all of a sudden I realized, wait a second, this book is called What Disappears. What could that possibly mean? Because up until close to the end, I, um, I hadn't you know, thought about that concept or that theme in what you were writing. And then as you're you know, wrapping the themes together and the, and the threads are coming back together and, and we're sort of starting to see into the future a little bit for some of the characters, I started to think about what disappears and you know, what you were saying about that throughout the whole book. And you were saying a lot of things, but one in particular has to do, I mean, I, in, in my, my take of it, um, the fact that what disappears is all we have. And, you know, we, we don't know what lies ahead. And so we don't have that yet. And all we have is what's behind, which has all disappeared. And would you talk to us about how you came up with that title? And did it come at the beginning, the middle, the end, afterwards? What does it mean to you? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I mean, um, what disappears was the title I came up with when I first finished the complete draft of the book. And part of it was referring to historical events, these whole societies that disappeared, the, um, well, the, uh, the Russian monarchy, which disappeared, not something necessarily to be regretted, um, the, uh, the Belle Epoque in Paris, that amazing cultural phenomenon that was um, spearheaded by uh, Sergei Diaghilev and his Ballet Russe, um, all of that and all of them disappeared. I mean, of course, all of history disappears and our lives disappear. And this was, you know, I, I was writing this before the pandemic and then all of a sudden everything was disappearing. Our ability to see our loved ones, our ability to go out and in public and do the most normal things, our ability to, to feel that our lives and our children's lives and our parents' lives would be able to, to um, continue for their normal expected course. Everything, every certainty was disappearing and um, our planet, our habitable planet is disappearing. It's just, for me, it's just, um, Maybe it's partly a function of my age, but it also seems, well, and it also seems like uh, a definition for dance. Dance is the most ephemeral art. A dance performance is there and then it disappears. And especially in the times before, you know, film and video recording, it disappeared completely. So you had to be there to see it. And it's also about mindfulness, the sense that, we have to keep paying attention because some of the most beautiful things, those we love, um, the most beautiful things in nature, the be be most beautiful things in art, it's, it's ephemeral, it will disappear. So we'd better linger there and keep our eyes open because it's all gonna disappear. <laughs> That's so true and so beautiful and so beautifully said. And that's why, you know, books are a way to hang on to things that, you know, we don't, that do disappear, but it's a way to hang on to them for eternity. Well, it's really true. And what you've done with your, your memoir is so extraordinary because your career as a ballerina, as a principal dancer, um, it's never going to disappear, Gavin. You have you know, you've ensured its um, timelessness and its continuation. So it's a wonderful gift that you've given with your work. And anyone who loves dance, who is a dancer, who wants to dance, who loves watching dancers, I can't recommend your book highly enough. It's beautiful and very accessible. Thank you so much. And that's exactly, that was, well, I had a few reasons for writing it, but that was a huge one. I just got panicky that my dancing life would just disappear and only exist on a few videos and photographs. And the, like the feeling of it was gone. And I just wanted to express and capture that feeling, not just the imagery of it. And the only way to do that is in words and descriptions. And so yeah, that's why I did that. 
You really did it. I, I think I'd like to read another little passage because it is um, one of the dancer passages that um, I wrote way before I read your memoir, but once I read your memoir, I realized, oh yes, there really is correspondence here. So it was exciting for me. Um, this is uh, a scene, slightly abridged, that takes place in the forest of Fontainebleau outside of Paris. Um, the character who was born Zanetta and her name has been transliterated in French to Jeannette by her adoptive parents who haven't told her anything about her origin. She's been riding in a carriage to Fontainebleau, um, blindfolded with her boyfriend slash patron, the fashion designer, uh, Paul Poiré, who, who plays a, a, a great, um, a great uh, role in the novel. He's a, he's a pivotal character and she, he's based on a real person. When she woke, the light was magically perfect outside the carriage windows. Paul gave the driver some money to take himself out for a rest and a meal while Jeanette hastened to clean herself up. She was still only half dressed when Paul, after unloading his painting things, extended his hand to her. Looking around first to make sure they were alone, she leapt barefoot out of the carriage and did a series of passe turns on the leafy ground, ending in an arabesque allongé. Paul, who was setting up his easel, shouted, Brava! I must paint you in that last pose. Only if you have fairies who can hold my leg in the air. Jeanette rubbed at a spot on her foot where a twig had poked her. Oh, Paul, don't you understand the slightest thing about how the body works? How the body works is your art form, Cherie. Mine is knowing how it looks. He took off the rest of her clothes and then one costume at a time, mostly just draped over her and pinned. He posed her and painted what he saw. I hereby declare war on the corset, he said, as he put the finishing touches on one of his watercolor sketches. No longer will the female body be entombed and distorted, divided into two badly fitted pieces by the wretched things these designs are much better without. She walked behind the easel to inspect his paintings, admiring how chic she looked in them, herself and yet not herself. She'd never seen any clothes like these before. Paul stood before his drawings with his head cocked first to one side, then the other. Yes, yes, they're brilliant. If I were designing the world, Every female would have the body of a ballerina. What a good muse you are, my dear. When I am done forming you, there will be nothing left of Jeanette Dupre, minor dancer for the Paris Opera Ballet. Why did he always have to remind her of her own unimportance in the world while puffing himself up so constantly? What shall I be then? Why, people will look at you and remark, there goes Paul Poiret's mannequin. Jeanette didn't think she wanted to be anyone's mannequin, not even Paul's. Not if it meant the obliteration of all she'd worked so hard to achieve, all she'd sacrificed to become a dancer. She knew there were countless aspiring ballerinas who would tear her eyes out for the chance to steal her place in the company. After all these years, Paul still had no idea about who she really was. Wow. Barbara, which did you write first, poetry or novels? Poetry, um, because um, at the age of nine, when I started writing poetry, um, I didn't have any idea how to write a novel. So um, I, I first, I, I wrote poetry from the age of nine on. I, I did. I mean, I, re, I remember one of the poems was far into the night, I see myself. I am alone. I mean, I was rather a wow. melodramatic child. Um, but um, I, I really wanted to be in theater, either on the stage or in films. And I realized at about the age of 18 that I didn't have the talent or the looks to do either. And I thought, what can I do? Um, I thought, well, I've always written, I guess I can write. And so I was an English and French major, 
at the University of California at Santa Cruz, wonderful professors there. I had a wonderful opportunity there. Never took a writing class because I kind of don't believe in it, um, but I read. I read widely and I think reading is the best training for anyone who wants to write. Just read the best books you can get your hands on. Um, and it wasn't until I went away to Ireland that I, I started my first um, sustained piece of uh, narrative fiction. Mm. Took a long time, took me 10 years to finish my very first novel, Northern Edge. I was writing it while living on a sailboat and I was kind of writing this as the boat rocked. <laughs> um, but it took me a really long time and I was writing it in between working full time. And then my next novel, Vivaldi's Virgins, took me about six years of research and immersion and writing and still working. And um, second novel was much faster, the YA novel, A Golden Web. And this one really, though, if you start it from the beginning of when I started it, it took over 40 years. So Gosh. long time. Wow. And I write poetry. Poetry okay. is the way I keep in touch with myself and it's my emotional survival. I, yeah, I think I'm kind of a, I don't know. I'm not, um, I, I'm stable. I'm a stable person. My friends can tell you, you can tell me. Um, but I think there's a little bit of um, a ten tendency to be too porous. And um, I remember this from an early age that, you know, just things like colors would affect me so deeply. It was sort of overwhelming. And poetry and dance are what uh, dance grounds me. I, I, my dance classes are mostly taken barefoot, really helps me get out of my over clogged head. And poetry gives me salvation from my own um, emotions. So poetry helps order everything in a, the most economical way. And so without these things and, and without my son, being a mom is really, really important to me and being a wife. Um, these are the, these are the uh, legs under my chair that keeps me um, sitting upright. What is your actual writing process like? You referred earlier to using a fountain pen and notebooks and writing everything longhand. And that's so fascinating to me because when I'm writing, I, it, I, I've, I can't do longhand because I can't get the words out fast enough. Mm -hmm. I have to type because if I take a, if I take enough time to write them longhand, I lose them. And it sounds like you've got them in your head. So fully formed that that's not a risk, but yeah, I'm always so curious what other writers daily practices are like. Well, first of all, I, I write really messily and, you know, I think anyone would have trouble interpreting my mm -hmm. scratches and my journals, but um but there, when I do journalism, and I occasionally do, uh, or interviews, you know, that are email interviews, I do write directly onto the computer. So that works for that. There's something about the sensibility required, or maybe it's the connection with one's own imagination that is, um, for me, at least, uh, a computer is antithetical to that, the, the noise of it, the expectation of it, the light it shines. Um, it's all wrong. I need to be in a, usually in a kind of cloistered place, you know, with a single light, very much alone. And um, I, I never have written uh, poetry directly on a computer. It just, it doesn't work for me. It's a, it's almost a depositing, taking what's inside my head and my heart and putting it down into the notebook and that it's the also the sensual process of writing, forming the letters with the ink. You know, it's wonderful. I love getting a, a brand new notebook and you watch as you put the ink down there, the layers of ink, the, the, the notebook becomes wider. I know. You know, I know. It's so wonderful to, to yeah. witness. And it gives weight and heft to our words mm -hmm. in a way that, computers just don't. Yeah. So it's a kind of a, a sensual satisfaction. I don't know. That works. I, I can completely understand that. I can imagine writing 
poetry, really the satisfaction of long, longhand, like this, the tactile feeling of the pen and the paper. And yeah, I can completely relate to that. Um, are you working on anything now? I know you're just overwhelmed with getting what disappears out into the world and helping it succeed. And But uh, do you have thoughts about a next project? Are you already working on another one? Well, because, I mean, as you say, I've, I've been really, really busy um, promoting the book and sharing it with people. Um, but all the while I've been madly writing poetry. So I've been surprised at that. And I think it's because I'm so stressed by um, you know, being on the self-promotion train. I mean, for people who are dreaming of writing, you know, it's it's not all fun. And writing is wonderful. I love writing more than anything else. But the process afterwards, it can be a real nightmare. It's not as bad for me, maybe not as bad for you, because we're both trained as performers in some way. So it's not, you know, that onerous in that way. But many, many writers are just um, very shy and don't want to have anything to do with promoting their work in public. And now you you have to, and social media is necessary. And it's just a, a nightmare, the whole thing on so many levels. Although I do love, I love connecting with readers. That for me, when I get um, a letter from a reader somewhere in the world who says, oh, your book was so important to me. I was in this crisis and it, you know, it saved me. I, you know, I just, I feel like, okay, I can, I can die now. I mean, that, that's, that's what you want. As Ian Forster said, you know, only connect. Mm -hmm. um, did that answer your question? <laughs> yes, it did. It did. Except I still want to know more <laughs> um, about, so when you're on a roll with, uh, with one of your novels or with a long piece of prose or narrative, What's like, you know, are you what one of those writers that's at your desk 12 hours a day or do you, you know, get your inspiration in the garden or when you're walking or dancing and then you race back to your desk to start writing again? What does your life look like, if I may pry? Of course. Well, there have been I do garden a lot. I, I find a lot of poems, especially in the garden. It's really funny. They're just there. <laughs> I, <pick them laughs> and I bring them inside. And um, in terms of. Uh, narrative fiction. Uh, I also, I, I find things on walks. There have been times where I've actually dictated a, a line into my phone because I'm somewhere in the middle of nowhere without paper and pen and something has occurred, you know, and I want not to lose it because those words are really ephemeral. And, you know, you might think when you wake up from, you know, the dreaming life and first thing in the morning, you think, oh, that is so striking. I will never, ever forget that image. And you do, if you don't write it down. So I always keep a notebook by my bed. And, um, you know, when I go somewhere where I know I'm going to be there for a while, I carry my notebook with me. Because you just, you never know, but I don't need inspiration. I, you know, life is so inspiring the mystery of people the fraught nature of relationship the the beauty of connecting the beauty of stories you read in the newspaper the the, the heroism the tragedy the the simple beautiful lives that people live inspiration is everywhere i've never suffered in a you know knock on wood from writer's block. I just, it's almost inconceivable to me. If we keep our channels open, how can we not be inspired? This world is so inspiring. History is so inspiring. I mean, whenever I travel in Europe and I'm looking at these paintings and thinking about the people, the contemporaneous people who were posing for these paintings, wow, that shows so much about their lives. That's how they ate. That's how they dressed. And that's how they slept. And, you know, what was the relationship between two of the, these people? What was the relationship between that gorgeous novel on that ceiling in Venice and the, the painter who was painting her? Were they having an affair? Was he, you know, using her, exploiting her in some way? She never got to speak. What if she spoke? I mean, right there, there's another novel. So it is everywhere. Wow, it really is. It really is. In terms of what's up next, I, I have a couple of um, complete novels that are just waiting. Um, one of them takes place in Budapest. It's called um, 
uh, the Stolen Child, sometimes it's called um, Demeter. It's a modern retelling of the, um, the myth of Demeter and Persephone, and, and it takes place in Budapest right before the changeover to a multi-party democracy. I did my research by, you know, just by mistake while I was researching something else, a nonfiction book. Um, I lived in Budapest at that time. It was an incredible time, and I was madly taking notes, and I was embraced by um, the Jewish political underground there, which was amazing because I'm a completely secular Jew, but I loved them and I loved their passion for democracy. And um, so that's where that book takes place. I did find a story for that that I wanted to tell, and I'm hoping to get that out in the world. It wasn't considered to be close enough to the brand, I hate that word, of Vivaldi's Virgins. So that's why the publisher didn't pick it up. Um, there's another book I've sort of been keeping on ice, and it's based on two years um, when I was a poor, very poor single mom. And um, in order to uh, allow my son to attend a really good public elementary school, I ran an international boarding house. And this is called um, Boarding House Reach, a novel with recipes. And so it's a, it's a little naughty. And I've been sitting on it waiting till my son grew up. And he's, you know, he's 29 now. I think he can handle it. And um, I think I'm going to try to get it out there. So, well, I can't wait for that. <laughs> Good. Me too. It's going to, it's going to be fun. It really will be. I'm sure. The crazy thing about the wonderful thing about what disappears is it brought together all the different threads of my life, which had been pretty much separate. My kind of secret life as a dancer. I remember once giving a reading at, a, at another bookstore and somebody from the audience came up to me with her hands on her hips and she was very resentful. She said, I thought you were a dancer because she had been in dance classes with me and she didn't know I was a writer. She just happened to come to this reading, which was really great. I was so happy. Yes. <laughs> you know? um, but it brings together my secret life as a dancer, my right, my life as a writer, my life as a Jewish American with this really, I think, fascinating history, family history in Russia. And um, it brings all of that together into one book. And also my, I guess it brings together the sense of um, my spiritual, spiritual connection with the, with the world. Because for me, I dug deep for this book and I went to those places inside me to find the things that most deeply move me and are, have become my beliefs my core values as, um, as a 68, no, I'm not quite 68 yet, but almost 68 year old woman living in this world, experiencing a lot of life, you know, more than people usually get to experience, you know, multiply married, all this stuff. And um, I wanted to put it all in here. I did not leave anything out. And it, it feels scary and wonderful to finally be integrated. And maybe also my secret life as, well, my life is a secret twin. You know, I don't really believe in astrology, but I am a, a Gemini myself. And writing about these divided characters, Jeanette and Sonia, I was writing about those two sides of myself, the wonderful, warm, motherly, nurturing side who bakes bread and you know loves to cook and have people at her table and loves her son. And that that real bitch inside me who just cares about um, art and her career and wants to um, wants to fulfill her goals and is putting herself first. So I got to explore both those things in me. It was scary as hell. <laughs> Writing is scary. Putting one's life on the page is scary, especially was- when suddenly when people start reading it. It really is. Yeah. But it's wonderful. And it's so great. Um, It's so great that people do read it and that people do want to curl up with your book. And it's so great. And to all those readers out there, thank you. Thank you for being readers to all those librarians and booksellers, writers. We need you and we appreciate you. And to Malaprop's bookstore. Thank you. 
um, for hosting this and for having my book and having Gavin's book. It's so it's so great that we get to be our crazy selves and put our crazy selves into these works and you sell them. <laughs> it's fantastic. You share them and no one's getting rich, but we are, our lives are enriched by this experience. Well, that was lovely. Thank you so much, Barbara. Huzzah, huzzah. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. And on behalf of Malaprops, we really are delighted that you and Gavin were uh, here with us this evening. Before we go, just a couple of questions, if we could, please. Uh, one of them, uh, I was listening to Fresh Air with Terry Gross today, and Sarah Silverman was on. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about being Jewish and growing up in New Hampshire. And what she's found, she says, is that as she's gotten older, one of the things that she's realized is that she had sort of suppressed her creative self mm. in order to be in relationships. Mm. And she says it's only now that she's older that she really understands her process and she understands what she needs and that is very important for her to defend and nurture. And so kind of building on Gavin's question about process, has, has your process changed over time? And Gavin, if you want to take that on too, you can. What's, has the process changed? And have you ever had to defend it? Gavin, to you. The process, <laughs> my process. My, I didn't really have a process. I was just throwing it on the page. It was spontaneous. My writing process is spontaneous. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And um, it continues to be that way. I, I, I do a lot of journalistic writing now, and that's, you know, an assignment and I have to sit down and I'm on a schedule and a deadline and I have a certain number of words I've got to get on the page and a certain number of facts I have to cover. But, and that's actually helpful to me because that's, it's a structure and that structure practicing that way actually helps me creatively so that when I do have a flash of an idea or an inspiration, somehow it's like, I don't know, it's like studying your grammar so that you can write creatively. Um, Gavin, Gavin, I'm going to interrupt you for a minute because the reason I pointed at you is because I think both of us as women writers have grappled with this and we've grappled with it in different ways. And I can say from, you know, speaking about my own life, um, you know, openly as I've been doing, it is, it's really hard to balance relationship with the needs of your creative life. And I totally identify with what Sarah Silverman was saying. It's really tough. We're taught as women, you know, to be deferential. I mean, even now, and to for everything else to come first and to find that balance within a relationship is really, really hard, even to honor our own creative needs enough. It's not that somebody else is necessarily is um, making it hard for us, but we are making it hard for ourselves. So, you know, sometimes I've thought, look, maybe I should just go, you know, be in some religious community somewhere and, you know, you know, a life of celibacy where I could just focus on my writing because it's really hard. It's very conflictual and the conflict is inside of us because I want to be good. I want to be a good mom. I want to be a good wife. I want to be a good person and friend. And I really want to be the best writer that I can be. So, yeah, it's a great question, Patricia. It really is. Gavin, do you have, have you had to defend your territory or your, your process? You mean in terms of like writing as a writer? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, not really. I've been pretty blessed in the way my life has unfolded since I started writing. Um, I have not really had to defend it and, you know, I've had to defend it to myself to make myself feel worthy of doing it. Um, I've had to, you know, justify, talk myself down and give myself justification and validation for continuing to do it. Yeah. Um, but it was always, it's always been 
you know, something else that I did. It was, I, I'm still coming to terms with calling myself an author, even if a book out for a year. Um, I, I'm still trying to accept that title. And I guess the defense of it is coming, I'm defending myself against myself. Right. Well, that, that you know, that sometimes there's the internal struggle and then there's the external. We did get a question from Maxine and uh, Barbara. This is another kind of process question as well, because I mean, I would say sometimes writers seem to, um, it, it, it's like a mystery of what you all do. <laughs> you could even say with the fountain pen, with yeah. the computer, but it's still, really, is that it? It's, it seems very mysterious. And so the question from Maxine is, could you please speak about process in terms of are you a, and this is in quotes, not my own air quotes, I, are you a method writer that is living in your character's moods? Actually, it's a great question because, you know, as I said, and thank you, Maxine. Maxine's a wonderful artist who I met virtually through Gavin. Um, I, and she's a dancer too, I understand. Um, yes. Uh, I am a method, uh, I'm a method actor and I'm a method writer. And I probably never would have even said that before. But I, when I write, um, I, I read aloud in this kind of weird, speeded up whisper. I'm sure it would sound mad to anybody overhearing me, um, like some, you know, like some distant munchkin or something speaking. Um, but I am experiencing the emotions of my characters, I laugh, I cry, um, I feel angry because yeah, you can't write about the emotions from the outside. You have to, or at least for me, it only works to um, embody them. Sort of like dance, you have to embody the dance. You have to embody the poem and the writing, and maybe that's why it's so painful. I mean, sometimes when people at live readings would ask me, well, how do you write? You know, what do you do? Um, how can I write? And sometimes I would say, uh, it's easy. Just get down on your knees and um, get a sharp object and poke a vein and then just bleed a lot. And that's how you write. Um, because it is sort of like that. You just have to be willing. It's not, it's not a, a show. It's something very real happening inside you. And it has to come from the deepest places inside you. So I hope that answers it somewhat, Maxine. Um, I do. I am um, a, a kind of a mad writer. And I think to anybody looking on, it would seem like, you know, oh, I, like I'm some sort of schizophrenic person um, talking to herself, but it's it's a controlled madness, because of course, I know I'm doing it. But I do, I do do it. So that's how it works for me. So does Sarah Silverman, by the way, she was talking about speaking aloud and laughing and doing all sorts of things. So you creative types, there's always, there's something wacky and uh, idiosyncratic going on up, up in the, on the next floor, right? <laughs> yeah, that's saying it very kindly, Patricia. <laughs> well, I, I am, I, I think a lot of people who marvel at the writer and the, and the craft really look at you all with great admiration. And again, with this sort of level of mystery, and as we're closing out, uh, because I know we got started just a little bit late, uh, is there a book that or two that you might would just recommend to people, maybe one that shaped you, uh, one that you wish people would read, could have been overlooked, or one that was recent? Well, I'm, I'm really blessed to have a lot of writer friends at this point in my life. It's just amazing. And they're so talented. Um, a book I read recently that... I really love, and I recommend it to everyone um, by Carolina de Robertis. It's called The President and the Frog. It's just a brilliantly imaginative and economical and moving novel. I loved it. And I think it just won some big award or was um, 
maybe uh, nominated for the National Book Award or got it. I'm not sure. It got something wonderful. She's great. I'm just now reading something by a, a, a friend named Lynn Kaufman, who's um, a playwright and a novelist. And she wrote this extraordinary book called Divine Madness, which is about the love affair between Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Hardwick. And it's again, so evocative and it's really expressive of this kind of divine madness that I was trying to describe about how poets think and what their process is and how often it's just a nightmare for anyone living with them. Um, and this is much older and um, maybe more obscure, but this is um, by uh, Lampedusa. Uh, it's a, an old Italian novel called The Leopard, Il Gatto Pardo. And I just think it's fabulous, uh, just so rich. It is historical fiction, but it was written quite a while ago. Very, very rich. Anyone who, who loves Italy will love this book. It's really rich, really great. So those are three. I and mean, there's so many more I could recommend, but I'll stop there. That's all right. We've got your professional website uh, posted. So maybe someday you'll put on there, if you haven't already, a uh, a list of, of books that you might recommend and why because that well, that was a great trilogy there that was a great trio there of books that are very interesting and uh, distinctive I'll definitely take that suggestion it's wonderful I'll my I'm always you know building my website building new pages that that's a great idea I'm definitely going to do that Patricia thank you well uh, thank you uh, Gavin do you have a a book or two that you'd like to recommend? Well, I am currently reading, I don't have it at hand to show you the cover, but um, uh, Tony Bentley's brand new book uh, called Serenade, which is a, as she calls it, it's a biography of the ballet Serenade choreographed by George Balanchine. And Tony Bentley is a very prolific writer, former ballet dancer with New York City Ballet. And her first book, which is a, a memoir called uh, Winter Season, A Dancer's Journal, was written 40 years ago. And I read it when I was 11 years old. And it was, yeah, and it's, it is a, basically a diary of one season with New York City Ballet. And reading that book not only opened my eyes to what life as a dancer could be and was and made me even more hungry to do it, but it also shaped my concept of like what a really compelling dance book could be. And I kept that in my head and my soul for decades. And then when I started to write mine, I realized that I was sort of channeling Tony Bentley's work. And the format of my book is sort of similar to hers in some ways in the journalist or the journal format a little bit and episodic. But anyway, she has this new book that's um, like an emotional and historic biography of the creation of that masterpiece, Serenade, and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend I can't wait to read that. Thank you both so much. And let me tell the audience, uh, I, I don't think I've ever done this before, but please go to the YouTube page and take a for Malaprops and take a look at Barbara's poetry uh, reading. And we did a poetry event. That's something that we do every month. And Barbara was one of the three. And please take some time to go back and watch that poetry event and listen to Barbara read. So you can just uh, go and take a look at that. And as a companion to that, Gavin, when her book first came out, and I want to make sure that I give uh, being a ballerina, the power of perfection of a dancing life, uh, a nod to Gavin was in conversation and she read from her book uh, and the, these two authors tonight are a master class in not just the creative life, but in the, the lived experience of writing and living. And I really hope that you all will take some time to go back and take a look at Barbara's reading and poetry and Gavin's author event for being a ballerina, because if you love this, which I feel confident you did, 
then you're just, it's like getting two scoops of ice cream. You're going to get two scoops. Okay. So I want to thank you all so much uh, for joining us for this virtual event. Congratulations, Barbara, on what disappears. It's been a pleasure to learn even more about you, your work, your dedication, your craft and creativity. And it was a joy to hear you in conversation with Gavin. Gavin, it's great to see you again. And I want to thank you both so much for being a part of the Malaprops community. We value you so much. And I look forward to uh, getting a chance to meet the two of you in person and uh, visit the store sometime. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Good night.